Clara and the Sun. Clara and the Sun is written by Kazuo Ishiguro. It is his newest novel. After his last novel, The Buried Giant, came out in 2015, Kazuo Ishiguro, as I've already mentioned in another video, is my favourite author ever. Bar none, my favourite. He's also the winner of the Nobel Prize in Literature and the Booker Prize, a bunch of other things. I think he's a knight of the British Empire, which is a horrible thing to say out loud. And he's an all-round incredible genius of a writer. You can't really be hyperbolic when you're talking about the works and the mind and the writings of Kazuo Ishiguro. And we finally have his newest novel, Clara and the Sun. Everything I say here is going to be relatively spoiler-free, but that does depend on what you constitute as a spoiler. I'm not going to be spoiling anything about the plot, and if you know anything about Ishiguro's novels, you know that he does like to play with his plot and the things that he gives away and doesn't give away. He is famous for his unreliable narrators. He is famous for unfolding the world very, very slowly and progressively. A lot, a lot of twists and turns. His very first novel, A Pale View of Hills, he dropped a bomb at the very end, which was an enormous twist, established him as the guy who does the unreliable narrator, and from there on, he never really dropped massive twists in the same way. Instead, he would drip feed information, or his books would slowly unfold in a way that made you gently rethink and reanalyze and shift your perspective on the characters and what was going on in the story. Clara and the Sun, actually, it does do this, but in a far more gentle way. It seems like he's almost left the unreliable narrator behind at this point, but there is still a lot of twisting and turning that goes on. Anyway, that's a very, very long and weird and roundabout way of saying that this will be a relatively spoiler-free discussion slash review about Clara and the Sun. I will not be spoiling anything that I consider to be a spoiler, having read the whole novel. However, if you do see or hear anything in this video that you consider to be a spoiler, I'm really sorry. I would probably disagree because I left it in and said it was spoiler free, but we all have our own opinion on what spoilers are, so let's just jump into it. Oh, I pressed record, I got something in my eye. Oh my god. Ow. Oh. Okay, I'm fine. Where am I? So as I said, Clara and the Sun is Ishiguro's first novel in about six years. He typically does this, he's been writing since the early 80s, and he releases a book every five to ten years, and that's more or less his pace. So waiting six years for a novel after The Buried Giant was pretty typical for him. And now we have it, Clara and the Sun. Kazuo Ishiguro is known for pushing boundaries when it comes to genre. He's not known as an author of genre fiction, and yet his books often are genre fiction in some way. They might be historical fiction, like The Remains of the Day, or they might be science fiction, like Never Let Me Go. The Buried Giant was basically a fantasy novel set in Arthurian fantastical Middle Ages England. If you were to put this in a genre, like Never Let Me Go, this is a work of science fiction. But because it is intensely philosophical literary fiction, we don't really talk about the fact that Ishiguro has now written two sci-fi novels, because it's so grounded in the real world. But then science fiction really does have kind of two definitions. One is the space opera, like Star Wars, which isn't really sci-fi, it's fantasy. And then you have science fiction that is philosophical and is intensely considerative ideologies and ideas and big brain thinking, like, I don't know, Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov, etc. And I guess you could actually compare this in some ways to the works of Isaac Asimov or Ian Banks, maybe. No, not Ian Banks. Why did I say Ian Banks? So what's it about? Clara and the Sun tells the story of the titular Clara. Clara is an AF. AF stands for Artificial Friend. Artificial friends live in a shop on a display. They are completely conscious, but they behave in the way that the manager of the shop tells them to behave while they are hoping to be selected. The purpose of an artificial friend is essentially to be a companion to a teenager. So every day, mothers and their children will come into this shop and browse the AFs. They'll talk to the manager about the different models and personalities. Every AF is unique, they have a full artificial intelligence, and Clara is one of them. The book is made up of six chapters. These chapters can be anywhere between 20 and 100 pages. They're actually called parts, parts one to six. All of part one is set in the shop. It's about 40 pages, and it's set in the shop that Clara exists in. 
It's a shop in a city somewhere in the US, it's not specific. And you know it's in the US, you know immediately it's in the US because Ishiguro uses American spellings all the way through until a mother and son are introduced in part two and the mother and son emigrated from England and they use English spellings in their dialogue. I thought it was a really clever way of doing it. So the son says mum instead of mom. They spell colour and flavour with a U and stuff like that. And I thought that was such a wonderful linguistic touch to highlight the fact that they are British in an American world. I thought that was really clever. Anyway, that's a side note. Clara lives in this shop and she's moved around a lot. The manager redoes the display every week or two and puts two AFs in the window and then if they don't sell she moves them to the back and puts two others in the window and they all get moved around. And you come to really like this shop. The whole novel is told from Clara's perspective. It is in the first person, it is all in her mind. And because she is an artificial friend, sometimes she is a fly on the wall because humans often treat the AF as, you know, a servant or a maid, someone who just sort of stands in the room and their opinion doesn't really matter. So she gets to just observe and give us her perspective or simply relay information. So she works really well as a narrator. It's a wonderful device using Clara in that sense. And it works within the context of the world. One day in the shop, a girl called Josie comes in. Josie and her mum, who mostly throughout the book is just called the mother. Her name's Chrissy. Josie and Chrissy come in. And Josie loves Clara immediately. She keeps saying to her mum, I want this one, I want this one. And eventually they, you know, they leave and then they come back a few weeks later and Josie keeps her eye on Clara. She wants Clara as her AF. Josie's about 13, 14 years old and she wants Clara. And throughout chapter one, you're building up a little bit of information about Clara, about the shop, the role of the AF, the world that they live in, and Josie, who is drip-fed through these constant three or four times that she comes into the shop. Chapter one also establishes the titular son. The son, the, the son, is kind of a character in this. The son plays a really, really big role in the story, especially from Clara's perspective. Some of what the son does is considered spoiler territory, so I will tiptoe around that. But from the very beginning, Clara has a relationship with the sun. And from a very physical and literal perspective, this is because artificial friends or AFs are solar powered. And so they love the sun, they love being directly within sunlight because it gives them energy. And that is never explicitly stated, but implicitly stated, as is Ishiguro's way. That's, that's how he always writes. Doesn't often explicitly say things, they are implied through context usually. So Clara's solar powered, she loves the sun, but Clara also is not fed information in the way that we are by parents and by school. And so she picks things up by intuiting them. She observes and tries to piece together an understanding of the world based on fractured information. And so she sees the sun, the sun gives her energy, the sun also sets behind the tall buildings of the city. And Clara wants at the beginning to see where the sun sets and where the sun goes to sleep, believing as children might do or people in the past might have, I'm not an anthropologist, would believe that the sun might go to bed somewhere in the earth. You know, that it is actually within our atmosphere and it rises out of the earth and down, pulled along by Apollo's chariot or whatever. So she has a relationship with the sun. She sees the sun as a god, as a, an almost a parent figure, a guiding light. And the sun continues to play this role all the way through the book. And it feeds into this very clear ideology that Ishiguro has about religion, but not just religion, luck and superstition. And this plays a really important role later on. I won't go into it, but Clara has a superstitious religious relationship with the sun based on what she understands regarding her limited worldview. Part one ends with Josie selecting Clara and Josie's mother Chrissy saying, okay, we can take Clara home. So they purchase Clara and Clara is taken from the shop, from the city and moved deep out into the countryside where they live. I was chewing my nails towards the end of part one, hoping that this was the direction that the story was going to go in because I was so invested in Clara and Josie's relationship before it had even started. I needed Clara to be selected by Josie. I needed Clara to have a good life and not be abandoned. I had no idea how the story was going to go. The blurb doesn't give much away. And I could have just read a review. Every review tells you. That's why I'm not spoiling it for you here. Every review of this book tells you 
Josie selects Clara and Clara goes to live with Josie because it happens 40 pages into this 310-ish page book. So that's not a spoiler. Part two introduces us to Josie's world. Josie lives in a house in the countryside and the only other house for miles around is their neighboring house, which is owned, as I said, by that British family, which is a mother and son. The son, his name is Rick. He is Josie's best friend. The two of them have grown up together because they're the only people around. They are neighbors and there are no other neighbors. And so Rick and Josie have grown up together and they have a very strong relationship. And throughout the book, Rick plays a very, very major role. There's a very small cast of characters in this. It's Josie and her family, Rick and his mother, Clara, a few other people we meet who are integral to the plot's events, but that's pretty much it. And all of these people are really, really likable and really interesting in their own right. So we meet Rick, we meet Josie, and we're out in the countryside. As for the world itself, everything is drip-fed in little tiny doses here and there. The fact that we live in a pretty polluted world, it must be set either in an alternate reality or somewhere probably slightly in the future. It could be 50 years from now or 100 years from now but it's a very familiar place. The only thing is that there seems to be a lot more pollution now. What's really interesting is that the reason we don't get much information about the world, everything sort of exists in the periphery and we don't get any clear information, is because we're seeing everything through Clara's perspective. And physically, Clara's eyes work differently. She's a robot and Clara sees the world in shapes. A good, great example is oblong. Throughout the book, Clara remarks on people using their oblong and it's very clear that an oblong is either a phone or a tablet. It is something portable with a screen that people watch things or talk to other people. It's a phone slash tablet and she calls it an oblong. Everything is in shapes and sometimes when characters are talking to her and their emotions shift, maybe they become angry, she describes their body as that the shapes are moving around a little bit. It's kind of surreal and eerie but it only happens a few times. So because she has a literal physical, visual perspective that differs from the average person's. That means that we're getting a very skewed perspective on the world and, you know, Ishiguro's unreliable narrator, it's what he likes to do. But this unreliableness only goes so far. Clara is someone who is different from his usual narrators. Ishiguro's protagonists are not always likable people. They're not always good people. It's, it's not that straightforward. You know, Ishiguro understands that people are shades of grey, people are a mix of good and bad. And Clara is different because Clara is more pure. She's kind of like a child, she's wholesome, she's hopeful. She is engineered to be a companion to a child. She is instilled with a sense of childish, wide-eyed wonder, but she also has to learn and be intelligent and be a good companion, so she does pick up on environmental cues and emotional states and uh, context. So what we learn about the world is pretty much through Clara's eyes, and in that sense everything is blinkered, but Clara is not trying to twist our minds or dissuade us from anything, and any information she keeps from us, she doesn't know she's doing it. So from that perspective, we've still got the unreliable narrator in a sense. It's very Ishiguro in a very familiar way, but also not. Clara is a different kind of protagonist, and that's really refreshing. So the main story is about Clara's relationship with this family that she's now been introduced to, especially Josie. The Josie, Clara, and Rick dynamic is the main dynamic of the story. The only thing that I want to mention that happens in part two slash chapter two, which I think is really interesting to keep in mind, is that there is a single word that is drip fed to us a few times, and that word is lifted. There are two types of children in this world, lifted children and children who are not lifted. And for a long time, you don't really know what lifted means and you kind of get it from context. You kind of know as much as you need to, and, and Ishiguro is very good at knowing how much we need to know. Very, you know, he can see his own books from the reader's perspective. He's so good at that. He knows how lost or how unlost we will be and how lost he wants us to be. He's so good at that. And that's why I'm excited to finally read The Unconsoled because that is very much about feeling adrift. But I still haven't read it. I'll get to it. So there are lifted and unlifted children. And you, as I said, you get from context what these people are. What the book is mostly about thematically is love. This is very, very clear from the beginning because Clara has a loving relationship with the manager of the shop and with another AF who during chapter one is selected to, to go to a home before Clara is. And she has a very loving relationship with the son, which is, as I've said, a kind of god to her, or a, at least a symbol of luck and hope for her. So there's a lot of love and the book explores love in ways that I just did not see coming because we, of, we often bracket love. You've got 
platonic love, familial love, romantic love, brotherly, sisterly love. We have love in brackets. This book explores the lengths we go to for love, the way that we love, and the way that we interpret and understand love from all of these different perspectives and, and within these different brackets of love. It's a very intensely thematic book when it comes to love. And again, I can't talk about it too much without spoiling things, but it's amazing how much Ishiguro is able to explore love. Ishiguro also paints his characters as archetypes. A lot of the characters in this book really do feel like each one of the characters in here, in Clara and the Sun, represents a type of person. Maybe a political ideology, maybe a personality type one of the nine enagrams or whatever. It's like every character really fits a, a slot, a societal slot, and represents a certain type of person. And it's very gratifying. And it also comes across as not naive, but not childish. Simple, I guess is a word. This feels like a very simple book. I remember when I read The Buried Giant, especially compared to something like An Artist of the Floating World or Never Let Me Go, The Buried Giant was a very simple book. It felt like it was written in a more simple, stripped down, easy to understand way. And Clara and the Sun is similar. I would say that Clara and the Sun is most like Never Let Me Go because it is science fiction and it has very similar themes when it comes to love and relationships. But it also does feel like The Buried Giant in the way that it's written because its writing style is a little bit more pared down, a little bit more stripped back. It doesn't overwhelm and confuse. When you read Never Let Me Go, there is so much that is withheld from the reader all the way through, to the point that Helen, is it Helen? I think it's Helen, the protagonist, the main protagonist of Never Let Me Go, it really feels like she's holding things back from us. And, and obviously she doesn't really intend to. Clara and the Sun doesn't really have that. It feels more sincere. I guess sincere is quite a good word to use. So the writing of it reinforces that. Because the book is very much about love, how we love, how we interpret love, it has to be almost a more accessible book because it's a book that is kind to the reader. When you read An Artist of the Floating World or Never Let Me Go, those two books are very intense and they're very much about gray areas between good and bad, right and wrong. And they're very philosophically intense and heavy. And this is too, but because it has a slightly more positive bent, it's almost as if the writing had to be more accessible to match the theme. And I thought that that was just really appreciated. So it's very much a book about love. And it's also a book about hope, especially when you think about Clara's perspective and how she sees things and how she sees the people around her. She is really full of hope because she has a narrower worldview, but she's very savvy. She is programmed to be hungry for information and very, very good at observing. She watches people, she learns from them, and she begins to intuit and understand things very, very clearly. But she does kind of present quite a good argument for the ignorance's bliss idiom. That ignorance allows her a more hopeful view of the world while also allowing her to have a clarity of mind to observe and understand, appreciate and learn and grow as she develops. So there is a sense of uh, childish wonder to her that is maintained throughout the story, especially the fact that her companion, Josie, is a teenager. The book also does explore differences in class, differences between social groups, but uh, that really is spoiler territory, so I'm going to avoid that. So there are some potentially darker and heavier themes at play, but hope and love really do kind of win out as this book goes on, right until the very last page. And as I said, the book really doesn't give us too many intense plot twists. Ishiguro isn't really concerned with that here. It is about drip feeding information and it does become more clear. You know, the world continues to build and grow and expand as it goes on, but there aren't sudden revelations at all. It's, it's different. As I've already done a video ranking Ishiguro's books, in my opinion, from worst to best, I would probably, and I have just finished this, like I just finished this before I hit record. This might change, my perspective might change, but I would probably put it alongside A Pale View of Hills, somewhere in the middle. My ranking, to recap, at number one slash two in joint first place is Remains of the Day and An Artist of the Floating World, followed by Never Let Me Go, followed by A Pale View of Hills. And I would put this alongside Pale View of Hills and Never Let Me Go, it's somewhere around there. I'm gonna put it in fourth place. That's, that's really off the top of my head. I've barely had time to digest it, but I wanted to get this video out quickly because my thoughts are so fresh. I'm gonna do more videos and probably more written articles on Ishiguro because I always have more thoughts and more things to say and there will probably be more Ishiguro content in the future, probably more content about this. For now, that's Clara and the Sun.
It is a fantastic book. It is flawless, as most of his books are, but it's difficult, you know, you've got a perfect book and yet you're still able to rank them. I don't know, it's one of those errors of, of the human mind and, and the limits of language is that, yeah, there, there is no fault to this book. And yet I wouldn't say that it reaches the heights of Remains of the Day or, or Never Let Me Go, but almost. Anyway, I shouldn't be so obsessed with ranking. It's a beautiful book and it's well worth your time. It's more Ishiguro and Ishiguro is always wonderful. So enjoy. Clara and the Sun is a new Ishiguro novel and it is a new masterpiece. If you're interested in more information about us, if you want more background knowledge, if you want more background videos, I am putting out weekly vlogs for our patrons and maybe consider joining our Patreon and becoming a patron yourself. Every little bit helps us so very much. And as always, subscribe for books.